Part the Second, Chapter Seven of Dick Sands, the Boy Captain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alex C. Talander, Davis, California. Dick Sands, the Boy Captain, by Jules Verne, translated by Ellen E. Frewer. Part the Second, Chapter Seven, A Slave Caravan. The storm of the previous night, by swelling the tributaries of the Coanza, had caused the main river to overflow its banks. The inundation had entirely changed the aspect of the country, transforming the plain into a lake, where the peaks of a number of anthills were the sole objects that emerged of the watery expanse. The Coanza, which is one of the principal rivers of Angola, falls into the Atlantic about a hundred miles from the spot at which the pilgrim was stranded. The stream, which a few years later was crossed by Cameron on his way to Benguela, seems destined to become the chief highway of traffic between Angola and the interior. Steamers already ply upon its lower waters, and probably ten years will not elapse before they perform regular service along its entire course. Dick Sands had been quite right in searching northwards for the navigable stream he had been so anxious to find. The rivulet he had been following fell into the Coanza, scarce a mile away, and had it not been for this unexpected attack, he and his friends might reasonably have hoped to descend the river upon a raft, until they reached one of the Portuguese forts where steam vessels put in. But their fate was ordered otherwise. The camp which Dick had described from the ant hill was pitched upon an eminent crown by an enormous sycamore fig, one of those giant trees occasionally found in central Africa, of which the spreading foliage will shelter some five hundred men. Some of the non-fruit-bearing kind of banyan trees form the background of the landscape. Beneath the shelter of the sycamore, the caravan, which had been referred to in conversation between Negoro and Harris, had just made a halt. Torn from their villages by the agents of the slave-dealer Alves, the large troop of natives was on its way to the markets of Cazonde, thence to be sent, as occasion required, either to the west coast or to Nyangwe, in the great lake district, to be dispersed into Upper Egypt or Zanzibar. Immediately on reaching the camp, the four negroes and old Nan were placed under precisely the same treatment as the rest of the captives. In spite of a desperate resistance, they were deprived of their weapons, and fastened two and two, one behind another, by means of a pole about six feet long, forked at each end, and attached to their necks by an iron bolt. Their arms were left free, that they might carry any burdens, and in order for to prevent an attempt to escape a heavy chain was passed round their waists. It was thus in single file, unable to turn either right or left, they would have to march hundreds of miles, goaded along their toilsome road by the Halvedar's whip. The lot of Hercules seemed preferable, exposed though undoubtedly he would be in his flight to hunger, and to the attacks of wild beasts, and to all the perils of that dreary country. But solitude, with its worst privations, was a thing to be envied in comparison to being in the hands of those pitiless drivers. They did not speak a word of the language of their victims, but communicated with them only by threatening gestures or by actual violence. As a white man, Dick was not attached to any other captive. The drivers were probably afraid to subject him to the same treatment as the negroes, and he was left unfettered, but placed under the strict surveillance of a havildar. At first he felt considerable surprise at not seeing Harris or Nagora in the camp, as he could not entertain a doubt that it was at their instigation the attack had been made upon their retreat when he came to reflect that Mrs. Weldon, Jack, and Cousin Benedict had not been allowed to come with them, but had been carried off in some other direction, he began to think it probable that the two rascals had some scheme to carry out with regard to them elsewhere. The caravan consisted of nearly eight hundred, including about five hundred slaves of both sexes, two hundred soldiers and freebooters, and a considerable number of havildars and drivers, over whom the agents acted as superior officers. These agents are usually of Portuguese or Arab extraction, and the cruelties they inflict upon the miserable captives are almost beyond conception. They beat them continually, and if any unfortunate slave sinks from exhaustion, or in any way becomes unfit for the market, he is forthwith either stabbed or shot. As a result of this brutality, it rarely happens that fifty per cent of the slaves reach their destination. Some few may contrive to escape, and many are left as skeletons along the line of route. Such of the agents as our Portuguese are, as it may well be imagined, of the very lowest dregs of society, outlaws, escaped criminals, and men of the most desperate character. Of this stamp were the associates of Negro and Harris, now in the employ of José Antonio Alves, one of the most notorious of all the slave dealers of Central Africa, and whom Commander Cameron has given some curious information. Most frequently the soldiers who escort the captives are natives hired by the dealers, but they do not possess the entire monopoly of the forays made for the purpose of securing slaves. 
the native negro kings make war upon each other with this express design and sell their vanquished antagonists men women and children to the traders for calico guns gunpowder and red beads or in times of famine according to livingston even for a few grains of maize the escort of old alves caravan was an average specimen of these african soldiers it was simply a horde of half-naked banditti carrying old flint-locked muskets the brows of which were decorated with copper rings the agents are very often put to their wits ends to know how to manage them their orders are called into question halts are continually demanded and in order to avert desertion they are frequently obliged to yield to the obstreperous will of their undisciplined force although the slaves both male and female are compelled to carry burdens whilst on their march a certain number of porters called pagazis is specially engaged to carry the more valuable merchandise and principally the ivory tusks occasionally weigh as much as a hundred and sixty pounds and require two men to carry them to the depots where they are sent to the markets of khartoum natal and zanzibar on their arrivals the pangazis are paid by the dealers according to contract which is generally either by about twenty yards of the cotton stuff known as merikani or by a little powder by a handful or two of cowries by some beads or if all these be scarce they are paid by being allotted some of the slaves who are otherwise unsaleable among the five hundred slaves in the caravan very few were at all advanced in years the explanation of this circumstance was that whenever a raid was made and a village is set on fire every inhabitant above the age of forty is mercilessly massacred or hung upon the neighboring trees only the children and young adults of both sexes are reserved for the market and as these constitute only a small proportion of the vanquished some idea may be formed of the frightful depopulation which these vast districts of equinoctial africa are undergoing nothing could be more pitiable than the condition of these miserable herd all alike were destitute of clothing having nothing on them but a few strips of the stuff known as mbuza made from the bark of trees many of the women were covered with bleeding wounds from the driver's lashes and had their feet lacerated by the constant friction of the road but in addition to other burdens were compelled to carry their own emaciated children young men too there were those who had lost their voices from exhaustion and who to use livingstone's expression had been reduced to ebony skeletons by toiling under the yoke of the fork which is far more galling than the galley chain it was a sight that might have moved the most stony-hearted but yet there was no symptom of compassion on the part of those arab and portuguese drivers whom cameron pronounces worse than brutes footnote cameron says in order to obtain the fifty women of whom alvez is the owner ten villages containing altogether a population of not less than fifteen hundred were totally destroyed a few of the inhabitants contrived to escape but the majority either perished in the flames were slain in defending their families or were killed by hunger or wild beasts in the jungle the cries which are perpetuated in africa by men who call themselves christians seem credible to the inhabitants of civilized countries it is impossible that the government at lisbon can be aware of the atrocities committed by those who boast of being subject to her flag tour de monde m b against these assertions of cameron loud protestations have been made in portugal the guard over the prisoners was so strict that dick sands felt it would be utterly useless for him to make any attempt to seek for mrs weldon she and her son had doubtless been carried off by negoro and his heart sank when he thought of the dangers to which too probably she would be exposed again and again he repeated his reproaches on himself that he had ever allowed either negoro or harris to escape his hands neither mrs weldon nor jack could expect the least assistance from cousin benedict the good man was barely able to consult for himself all three of them would he conjectured be conveyed to some remote district of angola the poor mother like some miserable slave would insist upon carrying her own sick son until her strength failed her and exhausted by her endurances she sank down helpless on the way a prisoner and powerless to help the very thought was itself a torture to poor dick even dingo was gone it would have been a satisfaction to have had the dog to send off upon the track of the lost ones only one hope remained hercules still was free all that human strength could attempt in mrs weldon's behalf hercules would not fail to try perhaps too under cover of the night it was not altogether improbable that the stalwart negro would mingle with the crowd of negroes amongst whom his dark skin would enable him to pass unnoticed and make his way to dick himself then might not the two together elude the vigilance of the watch might they not follow after and overtake mrs weldon in the forest would they not perchance be able to either by stealth or by force to liberate her and once free they would effect an escape to the river and finally accomplish the undertaking in which they had been so lamentably frustrated 
Such were the sanguine visions in which Dick permitted himself to indulge. His temperament overcame all tendency to despair, and kept him alive to the faintest chance of deliverance. The next thing of importance was to ascertain the destination of the caravan. It was a matter of the most serious moment whether the convoy of slaves were going to be carried to one of the depots of Angola, or whether they were to be sent hundreds of miles into the interior of Nyangwe, in the heart of the great lake district that Livingston was then exploring. To reach the latter spot would occupy some months, and to return thence to the coast, even if they should be fortunate enough to regain their liberty, would be a work of insuperable difficulty. He was not long left in suspense. Although he could not understand the half-African, half-Arab dialect that was used by the leaders of the caravan, he noticed that the word Kazonde occurred very frequently, and knowing it as the name of an important market in the province, he naturally concluded that it was there the slaves were to be disposed of. Whether for the advantage of the king of the district, or of one of the rich traders, he had no means of telling. Unless his geographical knowledge was at fault, he was aware that Kazonde must be about four hundred miles from S. Paul de Luanda, and consequently that it would hardly be more than two hundred and fifty miles from the part of the Coanza where they now were encamped. Under favorable circumstances it was a journey that could not be accomplished in less than twelve or fourteen days, but allowing for the retarded progress of a caravan already exhausted by the lengthened march, Dick was convinced that they could not reach the place for at least three weeks. He was most anxious to communicate to his companions in adversity his impression that they were not to be carried into the heart of the country, and began to cogitate whether some plan could not be devised for exchanging a few words with them. Fought together, as it has been said, two and two, the four negroes were at the right-hand extremity of the camp, Bat attached to his father, Austin to Actian. A havodar with twelve soldiers formed their guard. Dick at first was about fifty yards away from the group, but being left free to move about, contrived gradually to diminish the distance between himself and them. Tom seemed to apprehend his intention, and whispered a word to his companions that they should be on the lookout. Without moving they were all on their guard in a moment. Dick, careful to conceal his design, strolled backwards with a feigned indifference, and succeeded in getting so near that he might have called out and informed Tom that they were going to Kazonde. But he was desirous of accomplishing more than this. He wanted to get an opportunity of having some conversation as to their future plans and he ventured to approach still nearer. His heart beat high as he believed he was on the point of attaining his object, when all at once the Havildar, becoming aware of his design, rushed upon him like a madman, summoned some soldiers, and with considerable violence sent him back to the front. Tom and the others were quickly removed to another part of the encampment. Exasperated by the rough attack that was made upon him, Dick had seized the Havildar's gun and broken it, almost wrenching it from his hands, when several soldiers simultaneously assailed him, and would have struck him down and killed him upon the spot, had not one of the chiefs, an Arab of huge stature and ferocious countenance, interfered to stop them. This Arab was the Ibn Hamish, of whom Harris had spoken to Nagoro. He said a few words which Dick could not understand, and the soldiers, with manifest reluctance, relaxed their hold and retired. It was evident that although Dick was not to be permitted to hold any communication with the rest of his party, orders had been given that his life was to be protected. It was now nine o'clock, and the beating of drums and the blowing of kudu horns gave the signal that the morning march was to be continued. Instantly chiefs, soldiers, porters, and slaves were upon their feet, and arranged themselves in their various groups with a havildar bearing a bright-colored banner at their head. The order was given. The start was made. A strange song was heard, rising in the air. It was a song, not of the victors, but of the vanquished. The slaves were chanting an imprecation on their oppressors and the burden of the chorus was that captured, tortured, slain. After death they would return and avenge their wrongs upon their murderers. End of Part the Second, Chapter 7 Recording by Alex C. Talander, Davis, California www.alexcetalander.com